planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man And until you thoroughly tested every last close just True, Dr. Sayers. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carwood and Company. All right, higher side chatters. We know the nefarious elite have their strings securely fastened to nearly all aspects of life, medicine, GMO foods, the economy, and education, just to name a few. But what if these grand manipulations go much deeper? Well, you might remember a show we did with Sylvia Ivanoa of the New Earth YouTube channel where we discussed the details of the new chronology movement and this idea that huge eras of our past and entire centuries were created to backdate history, thus justifying the reigns of the royals, and at the very same time masking the fact that this global parasitic takeover is not as absolute or as old as they'd have us believe. In fact, some researchers are now suggesting that the golden age of global peace was not so long ago, and that this invading, cosmic, archonic parasite has been systematically stomping out all remnants of that time, ever since, and only allowing us to see a narrative of death, destruction, and systematic rule. Well, one of these researchers is returning guest Cara St. Louis. Last time she was here, we discussed the depth of her book, Dangerous Imagination, Silent Assimilation, co-authored by Harold Kautzvela, which details the mind weapon we call the Prussian education system and the systematic dumbing down it facilitates, as well as the infamous black goo we've come to hear about in the alternative world. Well, one thing the Prussian anti-education system of control isn't shy about teaching is its official chronology. And as Kara looked deeper into the narrative of history and those who question it, she found more than enough meat on those bones and set off on her new venture, a series of episodic titles she calls The Workbook. Part 1, The Great Remembering, False History and the Survivors, details this historic fabrication. And part two, The Fae, outlines Kara's research into the Fae race being the original seed race of the planet. It's a conspiratorial one-two punch of the highest order, and I'm psyched to have her here again. Kara, welcome to the higher side. (laughs) Hi, Greg. That's fantastic. You are are one hell of a writer, speaker, (laughs) introducer. You know that? (laughs) Thank you. I have heard that before, but you're giving me too much credit. You're too kind. This really is the kind of topic that just requires all that upfront context before you can really even dive into the thing. It does. That's the thing. It absolutely does. And uh, first of all, let me just say, I know you have a bunch of questions and I'm really glad you do because that's great. But I want to say to the people out there that I actually used some of Greg's writing in the first, in episode one, with his permission, of course. He did one heck of a job on introducing Sylvia Ivanova's work um, on the Survivor series. And I was just blown away by how he introduced it. His ex, it, because it could be extremely, it's easy to get lost in the complexity of it if you're not very, very careful. And he did such a great job. I said, Greg, can I please start my book with your work? And he said, sure. So thank you, Greg. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you are too kind. It's a real honor to be put into print. <laughs> And I'm also really psyched to have another researcher who's really explored this new chronology thing. I mean, it seems to have quite a bit of merit to it, but we've only really been able to talk about it once before. And uh, I I don't want to assume everyone listening now has heard that show. So give us a little more context for this new chronology thing for the uninitiated. Oh, sure. First of all, let me tell you how I got started on it. I looked at Sylvia Ivanova's work. I don't really believe in accidents, but I came across her work when she was putting out I can't even remember the name of the fellow now, but there was a guy who'd gone, who'd used Google Earth to to cover the globe and had found these enormous network of irrigation systems globally that couldn't possibly be roads. They couldn't possibly be natural. I mean, they were all very straight and the entire globe was crisscrossed with these things. And so she did a pretty good job of highlighting his work in that arena. And that's how I got started on her work. The reality is, as far as I can make out (laughs) so Mm -hmm. far, 
Yeah. Well, actually, I have two sources that I use for the most part. One is Sylvia because she's done an enor- enormous amount of work on this and she's put all her work out on video. A uh, YouTube site called New Earth, one word, N E W E A R T H. And she led me to this fellow in Russia. Anatoly Fomenko is his name. He is an astronomer and a mathematician of the highest order and at this point works with hundreds of the same caliber scientists. He's also a world-class statistician. And he built his work taking apart what we call the chronology, which is just a history. Uh, A chronology, which most people, you know, don't even realize exists, is... The timeline, okay? It's the timeline. People know what a timeline is. And the timeline is used to mark her place in time, to mark historical events in time. And these historical events are often used to justify wars or dynasties or events that happen to trace the trail of cause and effect on on some event that, that has happened on the planet. And what has been found and has been coming out of Russia, thankfully, recently. I believe the original scientist who cottoned onto this was named Morozov, if I'm not mistaken. You you know, Greg. Mm -hmm. And this was Fomenko's hint that something was terribly wrong. I think what he did was discover that there was something wrong with the astronomy that had to do with the moon's rotations or the moon's cycle of rotations. And one of the ways that we keep track of what happens on the planet and we feel like we're able to locate something in time and space is because we have these predictable astronomical events like eclipses and like rotations of the moon and planetary movements and movements of constellations. They're predictable. Okay. And B, we will make note of something what's in the sky when a certain event happens and write that down or We can verify when something happened by looking back in the astronomy and the cycles and saying, yep, it probably was right around then because right around then would have been when they would have seen, for example, this comet or this eclipse or those sorts of things. So we depend quite heavily on traditional astronomy. It is traditional astronomy, which is not, by the way, astrophysics. At that level, it's really just trigonometry. It's very predictable and it's very simple and we really count on that. Which, by the way, we'll get into this later. That's where the flat earthers come in. (laughs) And so Morozov discovered that there was this big anomaly. In fact, he discovered that the chronology as written could only be valid if, in fact, for a period of several hundred years, the moon had just kind of lost its ever-loving mind and, and started going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And then, as we got past about the year, I think it's 900, It's either 900 or 1400, Greg. I think it's 900. As we got past that year, the moon settled down. Now, Greg, is it 900 or is it 1600 when Scaliger came on the scene? Somewhere around 1600 sounds about right. 1600. Well, 1550 is when when Scaliger came. Anyway, there's a period of time when the moon was just doing things that it never did before. And then all of a sudden it settled down into its regular repeatable pattern. Well, what Morozov discovered and then what Fomenko discovered was that, in fact, there was nothing wrong with the moon. It was the calendar. It was the chronology that was in error. Now, there's a fellow at NASA Newton, his name is Robert Newton, and he's still alive and he's still working the uh, alternative circuits, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, who absolutely insists that it's a moon anomaly. And because he was a top dog at NASA, people listened to him. But the reality is it wasn't. It was mistakes, deliberate or not. I think they were deliberate. So does Fomenko. So does Ivanova. And I imagine you do, too. Of course. It was an insertion. An insertion of several thousand, well, a thousand years probably. In fact, I think that there are three periods in question. One is 300 years, one is a thousand years, and one is about 1200 years. What these periods of time turned out to be, it looks as if they were manufactured to justify certain hierarchies, to justify the reign of certain families globally. These are the families that are still in power. Now, one of the things, Greg, I don't know if you realize this, but I read this recently. Queen Victoria in England spent an inordinate amount of time and money, quote unquote, researching her genetics to go all the way back to Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. so that she could prove that she was of that line. Well, 
That's just not what I heard when I read that line. What I heard was she spent an inordinate amount of money manufacturing <laughs> a line that went all the way back to what is supposedly what is commonly accepted as the time where this fellow Jesus Christ would have been born. Now, mm. this can be complex. The, one of the reasons I'm doing it in episodes, Greg, is because of that. In the end, the workbook's going to be probably 600 pages long. And frankly, it's all going to be woven together because it's all one story, right? Right. It's all one story. Chemtrails go in there. The false chronology goes in there. The Fago, it all goes in there. It's all one piece. But I have to say before we, and I know you have questions, which is great. I have not encountered yet any subject that I brought up that causes more cognitive dissonance than the false chronology. I believe it. People cannot, cannot get their heads around this, that this is possible. Yeah. But when you understand how the schooling system works, you know, it's bloody well possible. It's probable. You know, they've had two or three, four generations to sit us in rows and pour in whatever they wanted to pour in. Exactly. You know, we know that they control the entire education system. And so why would we think they don't control exactly what goes in that system? And why would we take everything in that system to be absolutely truthful? There's obviously a reason they put so much energy into controlling what we think from a young age. And I doubt it's because they want us to know the absolute perfect, true history of everything. Exactly. It's all a lie, and that's really difficult for people to get their heads around. Now, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? Ask me a question. Well, that is a huge uh, lofty goal, and for some people it is quite a bit to take in. But one of the major suggestions is that the Catholic Empire started around 1500 rather than you know, around the year zero. Yep. And one thing that you write about in the book on how this was done is you say that both uh, Ivanova and Fomenko also note that for many centuries, documents were signed and dated with a small I preceding the actual date, which then became seen as a one. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a date written as I 576 became 1576. This made sliding an extra thousand years in even easier. And right. that's pretty fascinating. And that kind of makes it seem uh, a little more doable. And right. what other tricks could you talk to us about that helped them to make that switch? Well, let's see. For one thing, we have to talk about Scaliger and Dionysius Petravius. Sure. Okay. These were the Jesuits. All right. The Jesuits actually come in with the schooling system too. Is, I have to say it's something that I missed and I want to put it in now when we get to it. But in the 15th century, there were two characters, Scaliger, Josephus Scaligarius is how he styled himself and Dionysius Petravius was supposedly his successor, but I sense that they really worked at the same time. And again, it's at that point, history can no longer be trusted. Scaliger got a hold of the chronologies. There were several, and people were chronologers at that time. And he, along with some Benedictine monks, sat down and just started to write it, I believe, the way the church wanted it to be, the way the Vatican wanted it to be. And because there was no internet, because there was no... Literacy per se, as we conceive literacy, and because the priests and monks, at least at that time, I'm not sure there were any before then, to be honest, because at that period in time, people have come forward to say, look, there was no such thing as Christianity as we know it before Scaliger got a hold of the chronology. He wrote it in with the help of the Benedictine monks. So people will often ask me, well, then... Where did the Benedictine monks come from? Well, I think they were Jesuits. All right. I think they were just Jesuits. And this is a giant concoction of a story. For example, Christianity in and of itself. The Council of Nicaea was absolutely real. You know, we don't know when it was actually, that actually occurred. It's supposedly about 432 AD, I think. But we really don't know what year it is. Do we? Right. Because we base everything on zero, which is supposedly when the year when Jesus Christ was born. However, all of the astronomical evidence indicates that he was a medieval character at best. If he existed, and he probably did, he was born in something like 1150, 1180, something like that. It's easy. It's very, very easy if you have a global population that's illiterate. Or if you have a global population that's on the run all the time, which actually sort of goes to that fey bit 
and Ivanova's other contention that we're not that far away from the survivors of Atlantis, then it's easy to slip things into everyday thought and your control factors, your control mechanisms are a church that's been invented by the Vatican. The Jesuits had gotten themselves deeply, deeply into all forms of education. And if you've ever read the Jesuit oath, it's blood curdling right. to read. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. I can't believe that this kind of an organization is allowed to exist on the planet. Right. And just broadly speaking, you outline some of it in the book, but it talks about, you know, I will swear my loyalty to this order. I will leave no man, woman, or child alive that doesn't submit to our reign. Right. Yeah. It's exactly pretty, pretty cutthroat. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. And of course, now we have a Jesuit Pope sitting on the throne. You can't call it anything but a throne, <laughs> Greg, <laughs> in the Vatican, right? right? But the one thing I did want to say while we're kind of in talking about the Jesuits, and this is something that we need to talk about a lot, whether they like it or not. There was a Pope, Clement the Thirteenth, I believe it was, a couple hundred years before the Battle of Vienna. So it would have been 1500, maybe earlier than that, who was so terrified. No, it couldn't have been because Ignatius Loyola brought them around in about 1530 or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He disbanded the Jesuits. He was so frightened of who they were and what they represented and just the terror that went along with this group of thugs that he forbid them to exist. He completely banished them and he scattered them to the four winds. And then there was a Pope Pius X, who was actually in one of Napoleon's prisons after the Battle of Jena, which is germinal to the Prussian education system, as we know. When Pius X was released from a Napoleonic jail, he was embraced again by the Jesuits. He put them all back together and made them basically his attack dogs, the attack dogs of the Vatican. So that happened about 1815, 1816. And the Prussian education system was rolled out in 1818. Mm -hmm. So you can bet they had something to do with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Now we're filling in the holes because this era yeah. of reformation and stomping out oral histories and indigenous cultures was sort of yeah. completed with the institution of the Prussian education system. And right. the rest is history. But right. Uh, how right. Well, the rest isn't history. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> pun intended. But so how right. does this uh, relate to the royal families and their justification for their thrones? Yeah. OK. One of the most brilliant things Fomenko did. And thank God we have these men who are or these people who are, you know, compulsively statistically driven. God knows I could never have made it through what he must have had to make it through to reach the conclusions that he did. Yeah. But there is a certain type of individual who is very, very intelligent and capable in that way. And one of the things he did was he came up with a list of criteria that had to do with a dynasty, any dynasty. And they were similar enough through all the dynasties that he concluded that he could pick and choose maybe 35 points that applied to every dynasty, no matter what. And he started to sift through the chronology. And when he did that, starting with Rome, for example, which is hugely important to the modern world, and Jerusalem and all of that, which was supposedly happening at the same time, he realized that when he made a wave out of these things, um, together, plot point for plot point, they actually matched. They matched to, to a st statistical certainty. Okay, it was like billions to one that they're not the same dynasty. And that being the case, he could look at all of these dynasties that were supposedly one after another, after another, after another, when in fact they were probably the same two or three dynasties. At the same time, certain families, when, when you stretched out these years, these centuries and these dynasties, families started to appear in the history records that had never existed before as pretenders to thrones and people who ascended to thrones and created family dynasties. And um, so they're using this false chronology to justify the fact that they're in power. They're still in power today. In Asia, there's not a royal family that isn't interconnected and related. They're all probably Prussians, to be honest. Right. Well, 
we know World War I was largely a family squabble in the beginning. Yes. And yeah. you got to ask yourself, how did all this one family get control of all these different countries that are all speaking different languages, doing different things? And when right. you take in this chronology into account, it just seems like some people came through, swept everybody up, took control, and then backdated their history and saying, well, this is how it's always been. We've always been here for a couple thousand years. These monarchs have been in charge. And what they really did is cover up that big switch. Yeah. And actually, Greg, if you think about it, that's not too hard to do. Right. That wouldn't be too hard to do, especially if you have control of the schools and control of a fairly illiterate population and a population that's sparse and spread out like Charlemagne never existed. And, and you know what's really funny, Greg? I have to tell you, there's this thing called the Charlemagne Prize. Have you heard of this? No. Okay, look this up because I haven't had a chance to do it yet, but I'm definitely going to write an article about this. Since Charlemagne never existed, and so much is based on either being able to trace your bloodline back to Charlemagne or territory in Europe is based on on the history of this Charlemagne character and all of those things. What's really funny is there's a prize that's attached to this guy and it's given to people like Henry Kissinger and all of the U.S. presidents mm -hmm. and people who are so adept at just pulling the wool over everybody's collective eye. You know what I mean? So for me, when I hear about the Charlemagne Prize, I just laugh because I think, they're giving themselves prizes for fooling everybody. <laughs> you know, essentially, that's what this is. It's it's a big freaking inside joke. Right. Ah. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I've got to write that up when I have a chance. There's just so much to write down, Greg. There's just so much. Well, yeah. And some people see the whole Nobel Prize system as the same kind of thing. Right. It's not about distributing awards organically. It's a tool where... This official established body grants their prestigious awards to the quote unquote experts who push the opinions and positions that they want to see out there. Mm -hmm. And because these people got a Nobel Prize, well, they must be legit. But when Obama won a Nobel Peace Prize, we all saw how that made no logical sense. It's just a perception thing. That's the thing. That's it. Anyway, so when looking at the big picture... I'd expect critics to say, well, what about the entire field of history and all the documents and artifacts we have? Obviously, only a small number of serious historians have realized something like this was off, but there's a lot of researchers out there. Right. How do we respond to all that stuff? What's going on with these original documents that most people assume our chronology is based off? Well, Scaliger got rid of them all. They don't exist anymore. In fact, what's really interesting about that is that they all disappeared in fire. Some one were either here, there, and everywhere. It's all been about fire. They're they don't exist anymore. You got rid of them. And if you don't have the original documents, you just have to trust that the copy, which is what Scaliger and the Benedictine monks and Dionysius Petravius made, is in fact the truth. That's a big leap, isn't it? You're really trusting one man to carry the history of the human race forward truthfully, authentically. And it turns out that that's not the case. And in fact, at the same time that Scaliger was working, we had our friend Isaac Newton. We've had all kinds of people. Johannes Kepler uh, was part of this, not part of the deception, but part of the pushback. Mm -hmm. Right before Isaac Newton, who had his own issues, believe me, I know that. But um, right before he died, he managed to put out a book finally that absolutely aggressively contended that the Scaligarian Chronicle was a complete falsification. He knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong. And he tried to say it was wrong. Johannes Kepler tried to say it was wrong. He wrote it. He said, you know, something to the effect of Scaliger has seduced me. The chronology is just a uh, frighteningly wrong or it scares me or something along those lines. Johannes Kepler knew that it was wrong. Oswald Spengler knew that it was wrong. And the list of uh, historians that have aggressively contended this chronology is huge. But of course, we're not allowed to know that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things people have to really understand, they really have to know this in the English speaking world now, is that in non-English speaking Europe, the chronology is being aggressively contested and has been for a very long time. Hmm. It's just in the English speaking world, we're very much living in a bubble. We're very much living in the Prussian education system. And they very much want us to believe that things are the way they say they are, but they're not. 
absolutely not. So bear in mind that people all the way back to Isaac Newton, who was a contemporary of Scaliger, have said this is wrong. This is absolutely not true. And there are no original documents to check, Mm -hmm. which is what makes astronomy so important, doesn't it? Right. That is the cosmic grandfather clock that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. But this Newton stuff, I was pretty impressed by this. You write that Newton said in the introduction of his book on the subject, quote, they have made the antiquities of Greece three or 400 years older than the truth. I mean, that's pretty uh, cut and dry. And then you go on to say that Newton did not amend things nearly as much as the later scholars. However, he moved most of the dates preceding Alexander the Great far closer to us than had been generally accepted. Some of the dates he analyzed pertain to Egypt, for example, shifting forward by 2,000 years. I mean, that's fascinating stuff. But if you're Mm going to respect Isaac Newton's work and consider him one of the great minds of history, you've got to respect this new chronology stuff too, don't you? Yeah, you really do. Thank God this stuff is coming out of Russia now. You know, the guy's got, Flamenco has his own website, and I think he speaks English. Right. I That's what Sylvie said. But uh, I was just going to ask you really quickly, I've never heard him speak in English because I thought about getting him on the show. Have you heard him speak? I haven't. I haven't. But I'll send him a note one of these days for sure. You know, recently I was in Vienna speaking at a conference on child abduction. Yes. Government sanctioned child abduction. I was an hour away from her and I thought, damn. If I could just get, mm-hmm. if I could just get out of here and get like an hour from here. I think next time I go though, I'm going to see if I can get down there. She's putting out a tremendous amount of work. I completely respect her because I, I know what it's like to get out there and really put yourself on the line for all the nutbags that are going to t- start taking shots at you. Mm-hmm. But she has said to me and, and you and, and anybody else that she'll give an interview, but she won't give a Skype interview. So hopefully the next time I'm in Vienna, I'm going to shoot down there and meet her. I hope that would be great. Yeah. But um, no, I haven't heard him speak in English. And I will tell you something that's very, very, very important. Being a writer and putting work out that is very important to me and watching it go from books to Skype and all of that kind of thing. And also, you know, in Australia and New Zealand, it's only available in Skype and things like that, which just really worries me. Um, if you want to delve into this very deeply, you can, you can buy the man's work. Mm -hmm. Every volume is like 500 pages long. Okay. This little book that I put together to try to help everybody understand what's actually going on at, at a very simple level was the result of piling through 2000 pages of Fomenko's work and about 42 videos of Ivanova's work. So you can take that. And then have a look at it and decide whether or not. But I'll tell you what's really worth it, though. I own those four books. And then there are several more that are only available on Skype. And that worries. I mean, not Skype. Kindle. Um, Kindle. That's what I'm trying to say. Kindle. I always do that. <laughs> it's Kindle, not Skype. It's Kindle. Anyway, um, they're only available on Kindle. And that worries me a lot. So I've got all four of his volumes. And I will try to find the actual written work for the rest of them. And I will keep it. And I will keep it safe. Mm -hmm. This is a very volatile subject. It's a very, very volatile subject. Now, what they have working for them is that it does create a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance. But when people are ready to hear it, they're ready to hear it. They really are. And I want to mention it's coming into my mind right now. One of the biggest weapons that they've used against this coming out into the public is this new nonsense about, oh, God, I hope you're not a flat earther, Greg, because I'm about to insult you. (laughs) No, no. I've interviewed some. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I even know some of them are good friends of mine, but the ones that are still good friends of mine allow me to think what I want to think, you know? Anyway, this flat earth stuff, what does it do? It discredits traditional astronomy. And if one of the ways that you verify where you are in space and time and realize that you've been conned is by traditional astronomy, then what better way to to get rid of that than to discredit traditional astronomy? And it also brings our world down from 3, 4, 5D, where we're supposed to be headed, straight back down to 2D. And if you're used to looking at a screen in the palm of your hand, then going right back down to 2D is not a big deal. You know, Mm -hmm. that's nice and flat. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, this flat earth stuff is a weapon to use against traditional astronomy, which isn't that hard. You know what I mean? And this is how we validate historical facts. And this is how we bust these uh, real, I call it the real game of Thrones, Greg. This is the (laughs) real game of Thrones, you know? Yeah. And um, it's how we bust it wide open. It's one of the ways we bust it wide open anyway. Sure. 
Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. Definitely. I consider myself earth shape agnostic. <laughs> the flat earthers, they they bring up some interesting points, but I cannot go that far. I just I, I like yeah. the data that they bring up, but I come to a different conclusion. I don't think it relates to the flat earth as much as right. other manipulations that have been go- going on. Right. Well, I can't even listen to it that much because of my belief in Fomenko's work. Right. Do you know well, what I mean? A, I do. So I want to ask you about who Sylvie calls the survivors, the keepers of the peace before this big invasion. Many researchers have talked about a culture that went out and spread knowledge to the indigenous people. And many of the indigenous people of the world have oral traditions and stories about being taught things by peaceful travelers. That's what kind of spawned the ancient aliens thing. But maybe instead of aliens, they were the original race, I guess, that was wiped out by these parasites. What can you tell us about this section of the story before the new chronology actually got put in place. Yeah. And it's one of the things that the uh, chronology is meant to hide. I'm convinced. I mean, this whole thing goes back to chemtrails and all of the ways that they're trying to divorce us from our perception and from cognition and all of those sorts of things. This is really a subject that's very dear to my heart. Sylvia talked about, the survivors of Atlantis being really only a couple of centuries behind in terms of our history, being very, very near to us. And she makes a very compelling case just on the face of that by pointing out globally, you know, um, example after example after example of building structure or a cultural remnant or, you know, some sort of evidence We all know that we go through these archaeological classes or anthropological classes or historical classes, and and there are giant sections of such learning of these academics where people just have to throw up their hands and say, gosh, I have absolutely no idea where that came from. We just don't know where that came from. Or they try to attribute a certain monument or a certain structure or or, or some such to uh, a people in a period of time, who were not capable of constructing such based on the line of history that we're actually given. If, in fact, we believe what they say to us about what people were capable of at a certain amount of time, then they could not have constructed a building or a, a temple or a, you know, a piece of art or those sorts of things that are all over the globe. What Ivanova is suggesting, and I think she's right, is that, in fact, these were built by survivors of, well, she's calling it Atlantis, and I think that that she's probably right. This is a name that we give the last uh, great advanced civilization. See, the question, Greg, for me is that how do we all know about, I mean, we all know about Atlantis in our sort of so in our sort of conscious collective, it's it's there kind of for all of us to know about. No one ever ever really argues anymore at, as to whether or not it actually existed. I don't think I don't hear that. I, what I hear is when was it? Where was it? Mm-hmm. I think we all agree that it actually existed. So being fascinated by what she was saying there, because that is absolutely fascinating, and she does make a compelling case. I started to look into some other aspects of what that could be. Simultaneously, I started to self-identify as uh, very closely with the Fae and didn't know what that really meant or why that anyone would care about that except for me. And to a certain extent, that's true now. I mean, it's really only a personal revelation for myself, but it led me to look into some things a little bit more deeply and things, and, and then information started to come to me because of all of those cosmic tumblers kind of coming together. And what I discovered was I was going back to a couple of battles. There was the Battle of the Boyne, which is a ritualistic Masonic battle between James II and William of Orange, I believe, in Ireland, uh, where Britain was handed over to William. And the Boyne River was very sacred. It's also very cosmic. And it was a ritual battle that many people have written. It was actually a reenactment of a seed race or an invasion coming from the stars. Okay, so I chewed on that for a while, and then I got to the Battle of Moitura. The Battle of Moitura happened much, much, much earlier than that in Sligo in Ireland. And my research in the second episode demonstrates that, in fact, there were races converging on the island of Ireland that were probably, for lack of a better way to put it, 
the bad fairies and the good fairies. These are Atlanteans. These are Lemurians. These are star seeders. Now, the other thing that I came across was a researcher in Germany called Gerhard Landmann. Mm -hmm. Gerhard Landmann came to my attention through my husband, who's German and is a tireless researcher. And God bless him. He brings me all kinds of great stuff. The Germans are doing fine, fine work, by the way. They're doing tremendous work. And I'm just extremely fortunate that I have access to it. Anyway, Gerhard Landmann has spent his whole life researching a couple of things. One of them was the Fey as a seed race, as a, as an alien, as a UFO, basically, mm. as an ET. Let me put it that way, as an ET. And the other one was the hieroglyphs that cover the globe. He's actually deciphered them. And that's something that we would have to talk about at a later date because you have to have a relationship to old high German to know what you're looking at. But he certainly knows what he's looking at. And he's demonstrated that basically it's the most ancient old high German that there is. Okay, so, but that's a segue. I'm going back to the Fey now. He's done a tremendous amount of research on the Fey. And it's linguistic, it's uh, etymological, and they've left hints everywhere all over the planet. It isn't just the tales of the fairies. This is how it became a story. This is how it became diminished in a way. As much as we love the tales of the fairies in Ireland and France and all of those places, this is a diminishment of what this these entities really were. Now, I will tell you that he has located, and you'll have to look at the evidence in the book, I suppose, but the, he has located the original planet. And the original planet is in Ursa Major, oh. which is not part of the Great Dipper. It's in front of the Great Dipper, which most people don't know. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Great Dipper is in front of Ursa Major. Anyway, it's part of the Great Dipper. It's the lower left-hand corner of the actual cup of the Dipper. And it's called Fecta, P-H-E-C-D-A. One of the things that the Great Dipper does, which for me sealed the whole thing in terms of metaphorical evidence and real evidence, is that as it circumnavigates the pole, or as at least as it appears to circumnavigate the pole, it creates a swastika. Mm. And that's yearly, that's annually. Now, Greg. We know that's an ancient symbol. Our planet's covered with them. Mm -hmm. Our planet is covered with them. And it used to be the most positive symbol that we, one of the most positive symbols we knew. It was only in the 20th century that it became a negative symbol. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're the planet is covered with these, the fact that the Great Dipper circumnavigates the pole like that, and the fact the Fae have been traced back to that particular planet, for me, this was heavy evidence that we should be having a look at this. And at that point, I really started looking into the etymological and language evidence that they've left all over the planet. And I started looking into oral histories, not written histories. We can't trust the written histories, but the oral histories, which lead us back to Lemurian ages and Atlantean ages and talk about even pre-Lemurian entities that came to tutor the Lemurians. All right. The Battle of Moitura can be seen, recounted in a bardic fashion by a fellow called Robin Williamson on YouTube. He did it at Megalithomania in 2009, which is where I first heard the story told. People have been coming to me, Greg, with evidence. People have been knocking on my door and looking for me once they realized that I was investigating this and then handing me books and handing me maps and handing me stories and handing me evidence that the Fae exist in a different way. Now, I will tell you that I believe the Fae exist on two levels. The Fae have been an extraterrestrial race and may still be an extraterrestrial race. But they also exist intradimensionally. When they first arrived on this planet, they were here for a very, very long time until they basically decided to join with the planet. The closest oral and visual and written description that we have as to what actually happened to those particular fae is in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Hmm. It is when the elves go into the West and they diminish in the, in the case of the fae, they have become married to, for lack of a better word at one with the planet. Now, what I've learned recently is that the planet where the Dracos come from is not too far from Ficta. 
And Dracos and Fae are diametrically opposed entities. And this is not a good thing for the Dracos, I think. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they tend to not want to be in the same room. And once I self-identified as Fae and really started going for that, Anybody who self-identifies as a Draco would refuse to be on the same panel with me, would refuse to be in the same room with me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It just became extremely evident that they didn't want to be anywhere near me. It's interesting. So let me ask you a question. Let me backtrack a little bit to the swastika and get a little bit weird here. But we know that the Nazis, of course, chose that for their major symbol. Do you think there could be any connection or reasoning for that? Is it possible that the Nazis were trying to restore some kind of fey bloodline? I mean, they talk about blonde hair, blue eyes, which is a lot of what uh, Nordic people who experience ET abductions with a Nordic uh, present. That's how they're described. Right. It seems like there might be some connection. here. Well, it could be. And actually, I've not ever had anybody put it to me in quite that way. But actually, you're, you're probably on to something there. You know, I'm married to a German who was just post-World War II and parents were, I mean, he's very, very deeply connected to that entire story and, and untangling that story. And the whole thing with World War II is such a mess. It's such a mess in terms of what we know, what we understand, who was on whose side. There's certainly no doubt that the uh, part of Himmler, I think, was the head of the esoteric or the occult. Yes faction of Hitler's regime. There's no doubt that they were up to something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. And I will maintain as well. See, here we can get back to Ivanova a little bit. She talks about the survivors of Atlantis being hunted and chased globally. Yes. There, in fact, I'm sure of it. There is a good and a bad here. There is a I, I keep saying good fairy and bad fairy because I don't have any other way to put it quite yet, but there's a negative and there's a positive. And I, I think I'm going to be able to find that and uh, somewhere around the battle of Moitura, because I believe that particular tale talks about the Fomora who came from either under the sea or across the sea to Ireland. And there they met the fair bulk who were already there but just what, 40 or 50 days later, they met the Tua, Tua Hadadanan, who actually came from down from the Danube and Dana and across Europe and then to, to Ireland. And the Fomora engaged with the Tua Hadadanan, and that was the battle that to me was the first battle between the negative, if you want to call them Fae, and the positive Fae. And I think it was at that time that the battle was joined and the evil hunted good from that time onward mm -hmm. and chased the Fae across the globe. So here's another weird question. But do you see any connection between the lore that we have now of fairies stealing children or trying to yep. seduce men underground <laughs> as being at all related to the modern E.T. abduction phenomenon and these things being part of a real campaign? Yeah, you know, this is actually what I was thinking about today. You know, saying you're away with the fairies takes on a whole new meaning, doesn't it? When you think of it that way, <laughs> the reality I think is that if they were a seed race, then abducting their children, think about that. If they're a seed race, the lore is that they abduct children. Then abducting human beings sort of fits into that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a different way to describe what you might call an abduction. I'm not even really sure what that's about or why, but it's one of those things that leads me to believe that they still exist on the planet as well. So I could also postulate, Greg, that the bad fairies are still on the planet and come from the planet and the good fairies have married themselves to Sophia and are in fact at one with the earth. But I have to say to you right now that they are coming to a consciousness that they, they're returning to a consciousness that they have not experienced in a very long time. They are coming to the aid of Sophia. They're coming to the aid of Sophia. I know that. See, the chill just went up my back and mm. tears just filled my eyes. And I know that that's, that's true. Right on. I know that that's true. So let me ask you this. If there is a positive faction, because I mean, of course, there's a negative one. That's pretty clear. And the, the negative one, of course, would want to deal in secrecy and keep humanity enslaved and hypnotized and 
completely unconscious of what's really going on beneath the surface. But if there's a good faction, why wouldn't they just come out in the surface and be like, hey, guys, look, I'm clearly a fairy. Let me tell you what's going on. You've been manipulated. I mean, if they're if they're on the run, right. you know, th this is what they could do to blow things wide open. Right. Well, I don't know. I suppose that's a good question. We're going to need to think about that. It's the same kind of question I get about chemtrailing. Well, if they wanted to kill us, why don't they just kill us? Well, they don't. They need us. It's quite possible that all of the Fey need us. You know, the more I research and the more I get into this stuff, the more I realize that we are absolutely unique. Human beings are absolutely unique in the universe. And I, and I quite believe that most human beings have some Fey blood in them or some sort of ET blood in them. Um, we are sort of a, co a collection, an amalgamation of all kinds of things. And a human being is probably the only, no, I'm going to, I'm just going to step flat out state it. A human being is the only entity in the universe that can do what we do. We are very rare, prized, precious cargo. And I think that they have to be extremely careful with us in lots and lots of ways because they need us. We can interact. And this is the other thing that I, that I talk about all the time. We interact with the morphogenic field via the mechanism of our imagination. And I believe with all my heart that we are the only ones in the universe who can do that. Mm -hmm. And that is what makes us such a rare prize. And so it's quite possible that no matter what ET brand you think, you know, it, it, we're talking about or what, you know, Sophionic helper and shepherd like the Fae would be, we're talking about they have rules to follow when it comes to humanity. There are things they can't, they can only go so far. I, I, I can accept that. And you did mention something interesting just now about the morphogenic field. And I wanted to point out this other quote I had written down, but you mentioned the objectives of CERN in another area of the book saying, what if CERN and its recent calls for artistic types was a desperation move to try to harness our imagination to punch a hole into the morphogenic field, the material with which we project things we can see, touch, hear, and feel on this planet? I mean, that's pretty provocative and interesting. What indications do we have that that is what CERN was doing? Well, why would they need um, imaginative types? They're a science bunch. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we've seen their rituals. Yeah. The rituals are satanic, but obviously they already know how to conduct their rituals. They don't need human artists for that. What do they need the arts for? What do they need human beings who are uh, great artists or tapped into the artistic world for? if not to try to take that apart in a truly AI fashion. I mean, it's just the signature of AI is just getting ridiculously and ludicrously evident all over the place, you know, but you take something as, as scientific and an artificial intelligent, artificially intelligently driven as something like CERN and then ask for the world's artists who want to volunteer to be part of it. Well, to me, that just says they're looking for subject matter to try to dissect to, you know, try to get to the driving mechanism of what works our imagination. And you know what, Greg, they can try until hell freezes over. They can't get it. They, it we're unique. You can't replicate it. It's ours. That's why we're so rare and precious in the universe. Yeah. But they'll keep trying, won't they? They, they will. will keep trying. There's no question. They got to do what they got to do. And another line I liked from your book about their motivations is you say, what does this as far as the new chronology is concerned, what does this gain anyone? Well, if the movers of cultures and the manipulators of time are a parasitic entity race feeding on the negative emotions of living beings on this planet, then war and death are what's for dinner, right? And I like that. But And we've heard that before that very well could be our situation, that they're feeding off us in some kind of energetic way. Is there anything more you could say about the motives of these parasites? Well, I don't know that they actually have discernible motives other than hunger. There's nothing to say that anything drives them other than that kind of a base instinct kind of thing. Physiological instinct, yeah. Like a shark's going to shark. Like a shark, like a shark's going to going to chase uh, a fish, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it's about. Now, you know what? Interestingly enough, when you ask me that question, it kind of takes us to chemtrails. Are you surprised? No. <laughs> It does, though. It does. Because, you know, Harold and I have both said that we are biophotonic entities and that we exist. We surely exist and we 
purely exist when we're operating properly on biophotonic energy and that we derive that from the sun. And that's where our energy comes from. And so to get between us and the sun actually diminishes our energy, our positive energy, our energy that isn't um, negative, our energy that isn't fearful, our energy that isn't adrenalized and all of those sorts of things. So if we have no energy from, we have reduced and diminished energy from the sun from where we're supposed to be getting, it just leaves more room for negative energy that they generate Mm -hmm. by creating an atmosphere of fear and terror constantly. Right. I am just one of the things I talked about in Vienna. And that was a really interesting conference, Greg, because people were coming in I, you know, it's, it, they brought me in and they brought Henning Witte in. I'm not sure if you know who that is. I don't. He, well, he's a, he's a German, but he lives in Sweden and he, he identifies himself as a Swede, really. And he was an attorney that uh, was hired by some shipping companies to investigate the sinking of a ferry in a lake or in a, cha- in the channel between Germany and Scandinavia. Anyway, there were weapons on board that, ferry that weren't supposed to be on board that ferry. And so he discovered that. And so he started to make that public and then they basically ruined him. You know what I mean? He wasn't really supposed to discover that. Mm -hmm. So now he's on to other things. He's on to other things anyway. So he was talking about mind control and transhumanism, things like this at the same event. And it was really interesting because they brought in a couple of people who have had children taken away from them by the authorities to make these speeches about the Jugendamt, which is what they call social services in Austria and Germany, and how easy it is for them to come in and take your children. Does this sound familiar? I mean, this is going on all over the world, right? right. And one of the things that's, I mean, it's just not happening fast enough that they're getting our, our children's energy or turning our children or turning the world, you know, into this terror filled place. So they're, they're snatching our children from us and, and it's really escalating the terror filled nature of how we exist. Anyway, it was really interesting because the woman who organized this brought a couple of people in to talk about that as experiencers. And then somehow I and poor Henning had to like take our stuff and make them understand how, what we were bringing fit to that. So it was really one of the things I talked about was the terror that they build in the population constantly and they keep us this fever fever pitch constantly because they feed on that the negative energies and so the question is are is for example is there ever going to be world war three no no because they really want to keep us on the precipice that's where the payoff is keeping us on the precipice in fear and wondering where the next shoe is going to drop there was a sociological experiment if you did this goes way back to dangerous imagination greg but There's a sociological experiment where this guy was introducing electric shocks in subjects at a university, and he discovered that if he started being really random about it, and sometimes you would get a shock, and sometimes you wouldn't, and sometimes it would be really intense and all of this other stuff, that it was actually that not knowing what was coming next generated the most fear and the most anxiety. It wasn't getting shocked. It was not knowing. Mm Mm-hmm. That's where they keep the world in a perpetual state of high, high, high anxiety, just on the verge of, and this is what they feed off of. This is, you know, we call it the parasite. Ivanova calls it the parasite. I used to call it the predator, but the predator kind of indicates a a sense of intelligence that I actually wonder if it's really there. Do you know? Mm -hmm. Or is it just a parasite or is it both a predator parasite? Yeah, there's definitely something there. People usually say archons, too, is a popular term. Yeah, there's that. But I think the archons are a bit different than what I'm talking about in terms of the seed race and the good fae and the bad fae. I think that the archons can be traced back to the Teutonic Knights getting their orders from the Knights Templar in Jerusalem at about, well, at what we think was about 1100 or so. And being sent into the German nations, these tribes... These beautiful, gorgeous, beloved German tribes that were existing in Germany. I don't know if, if you've never been to Germany, man, I can see why people want it because it is a bountiful, bountiful land. Hmm. It really is so, sort of astonishing, kind of like the breadbasket of uh, America when, when we think in those terms. But anyway, yeah, so I think the Archontic infection is what traveled into Germany and became Prussia. I think it was at that time. Now, 
I don't know that we can't trace that back even further to something else. Mm -hmm. I tend right now to see them as different. That's fair. I mean, there's a lot going on for sure. And just to put a, uh, you know, a finer point on this new chronology stuff for the first hour, do you think there's any uh, reliable method to restoring the history? Is it futile at this point? Do you think the truth is locked away in the Vatican vault somewhere just in case? Oh, my God. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, tr the truth has to be locked away somewhere, Greg, because the ma black magic doesn't work unless they park the truth somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's a fact about satanic black magic, which is, you know, one of the overlays that we're living under right now. You cannot work the lie unless you park the truth somewhere. That polarity has to exist. Otherwise, the spell doesn't work. So I would say that every truth that ever existed is probably parked under the, I don't know, 90 football stadiums worth of vaults under the Vatican where they keep everything from us that would actually fulfill us as uh, beings on this planet, because that I believe is what they've done. And yes, I think we can get a somewhat true chronology. I know that Fomenko is working on that. If you can believe it, he and his hundred you know, fellows are trying to lay out what they hope they will be able to say is the closest that we can come to an actual true chronology. But you know, Fomenko's a scientist, and this is where he differs from Ivanova, and I tend to lean toward Ivanova, you know, but he says nothing can actually be known before 900 AD. Hmm. And that has to do with uh, just the numbers and the statistics and the astronomy and all of this other stuff. Right. I disagree with that. I think that Ivanova is really onto it when she talks about these structures and art and music and all of these things that are just sitting there waiting for us to rediscover them. Mm -hmm. It's only a couple of hundred years old. So, you know, it's actually a very, very exciting thing if you think about it. It is. And hell of a mystery. Of course. And there's obviously going to be people who have a hard time accepting this kind of thing. But just look at the official story of history. I mean, every civilization that's been conquered, they always destroy the records. I mean, the Library of Alexandria, it's like, would you really go in? and destroy records unless you knew what you were trying to do, unless that was part of your game plan. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that happens all the time. All right? the time. It happens constantly. It's just recently happened to me. I'm not going to name any names, but I will tell you that I did a lot of work recently. And one of the episodes that I did, uh, video episodes I did, was on the chronology and on the Fae. And there are no existent copies of these videos left and some and they've been destroyed Damn. and to me to me i mean i knew it i freaking knew it greg and i said it at the time i said it before and i'll say it now that is so the story can be spun the way they want it spun and it's you know you just have to continue to expect that kind of thing to happen yeah so you just keep going and you keep making records you know i have to say that i've gotten to the point and i've been doing this in terms of being out talking to people and writing these books, we're just coming up on the sixth anniversary, just the sixth anniversary of my mother's death, Greg. It's only been not quite six years. That's how fast you can get your universes, you know, blown apart. Okay. And I've only been doing it that long. And that's a good point you make, but it, it, you can even look at the historical timeline we're given, you know, we're postulating that they inserted thousands of years and centuries yeah. We are told that we basically were just rummaging around in the dirt for a very long time. You know, we we're messing with uh, wooden tools and stone tools and nothing much more. And then right. all of a sudden, when we do get advancements, you know, when the age of explorers happens, I mean, from that point to now, to yeah. the Internet, you know, I mean, uh, it seems like progress has been exponential. But if you look at things from this alternative perspective that they've extended history, it seems like, you know, we've always advanced relatively quickly. They've just hidden it under all these layers of manipulation. Right. Or we've been advanced for a very long time. Well, right. Yeah. And they've convinced us that we weren't. We were stupid. We were apes mm -hmm. and all that stuff, you know. Convenient for the overlords to tell us that. Very convenient, very convenient for them. And also the other, one of the other things that they both point out, both Ivanova and Fomenko is that, for example, Nero Caesar. Yeah, we all know about Nero and, and him fiddling while Rome burns and all of that. Well, he was actually a contemporary of the Habsburg Dukes of Austria. In fact, he granted the Habsburg Dukes of Austria rights within his empire. 
And those people were known to have been at gladiator contests. So those two things happen simultaneously. And we're led to believe that those things are a thousand years apart. And they're in fact, not a thousand years apart. Okay. In fact, the Roman history is one of the first things that Fomenko goes into because it's absolutely based to our modern culture and most everything that we do and how we operate is based on Roman precept percepts, you know, and according to based on what Fomenko's looking at and based on what Ivanova's looking at, what we're seeing is uh, a Rome that's been constructed. It is very, very likely, for example, that Rome itself was founded right on the heels of Troy. Those things were not thousands of years apart. And in fact, it was probably founded by one of the sons of Ulysses, not by the imaginary characters of Romulus and Ramus and Aeneas. They didn't exist. All right. Again, another another really good example is this idea that Jesus the Christ was actually a medieval character. Well, what year is it then, Greg? If we go by zero, and zero is supposed to be when Christ was born, do you have any idea? I don't have any idea what year it is. No, it doesn't make any sense. And it actually kind of frustrates me that all of our historical timeline and all the numbers are pegged to this Jesus shit and this uh, Catholic Church shit. It kind of it it frustrates me. Right. There you go. I mean, in that. So then it, but the astronomy better be right. Then if we're going to peg everything in modern civilization on that, then you by God better have the astronomy right. And if you look at the astronomy in reality, this is a medieval character and we've lost about twelve hundred years right there. So, see, there's already twelve hundred years that didn't really exist. There was no medieval anything. There was no there really was no dark ages except that is the colossal joke on modern humanity, isn't it? The quote unquote dark ages. Right. When what? When there was nothing, when we were in the dark, when we made it up. I mean, the dark ages, it boggles the, the mind to think about this, but just the Jesus thing with the 1200 years and the astronomy that proves it proves that we've lost 1200 years somewhere. Yeah, it's just such a shame that more researchers and historians don't discover that something is wrong when they try to seek out primary sources or notice that the timeline's skewed. It's a real shame. I know we're kind of winding down here, but inquiring minds are going to want to know what has happened with Harold since we last spoke. Has there been any communication or oh have you seen anything interesting happen? Yeah, actually, I can catch you up on that. I couldn't have previously, but in, oh yeah, I've got to tell you this, Greg, because two months ago, when I was talking to Miles Johnston, when I was doing the basis stuff, I said, look, I've got really interesting stuff coming out now. And it, how long could it possibly be before old Harold pops up again? And by God, right on cue, there he was. So he's been, Coming back to the stage covered in, you know, emotional and esoteric bandages because, of course, he's been working on himself for the last nine months. And, you know, it's all very dramatic. And so so he is back and he's back because, I've, he, you know, he's very AI. He's very Draco and they really can't create anything. They can only copy They can only steal. They can only absorb and move forward. And a couple of things did happen. First of all, about a week ago, I got an email from him out of the blue after nine months. And the way I read it, I think my husband would differ a little bit, but the way I read it was that he was actually willing to forgive me. Now, Mm. that just makes me laugh. Okay. I'm just laughing. Because I called it. It was right on schedule. There he was. But my husband thinks that maybe he's not quite so willing to forgive me. He's just kind of willing to talk to me. Anyway, I don't really care. I do know that Carrie Cassidy's got him back at a conference here in England. And I know he's speaking with Miles at some time soon in East London. So obviously he's back in a big way. And I believe that it's probably a foregone conclusion that he will be lecturing on the same things that I'm lecturing on. I think you can probably expect to hear him talking about the same things I'm talking about. Hmm. That's my prediction. Right. It seems like he's not talking about the alien black goo quite as much. And that was really what kind of put him on the map with the Margellans thing and and this big story that people were super interested in and people kind of resonated with. And then it just changed to, don't worry about any of that. There's some beings that I'm in communication with and they're coming in to uh, save the day. 
Yes. Yeah, so I don't, I, I, I really don't know. It seems to um, line up with whatever, whatever I'm working on. You wouldn't know who the guy was yet. Had he not translated the sun thief and the sun thief was chemtrailing and all of that. Mm-hmm. So it seems, he seems to be sort of in walking in lockstep with what I'm doing. Maybe I'm all wet. Maybe he's going to prove me wrong. Maybe he's got something <laughs> else going on, but I actually doubt it. Well, in terms of the truth of that story, I mean, has there been any revelations or further understanding of the alien black goo situation? Not that I'm aware of at all. The, the last I know about it has to do with what Harold was bringing, but Harold was really just sort of adding on to what David Griffin, that's it. My husband's just bringing up. David Griffin. <laughs> David Griffin. You remember David Griffin? He had a lot to say about black goo. And there was some evidence of the black goo in the sun thief, which I really didn't know was there until I looked for it. This was Harold's purview, the black goo. And even Miles isn't talking about black goo so much. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's happening with it. Interesting. I'd love to know. I don't talk about it. I don't, I don't, I'm not, this is not my end of science. You know what I mean? Of course. I do the social engineering stuff. So, Mm -hmm. which is an important piece of the puzzle as well. Oh, well, Kara, this has been quite the wild ride. I do appreciate you being here. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, this is really turning into one of my most trusted shows. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, good to hear. Thank you. I love coming on here because I feel like I'm not going to get um, sideswiped when I do. Oh, yeah. I try to leave it uh, pretty open. Yep. But yeah, I guess, is there anything else on the horizon you want to mention or maybe p- tell people where they can get these books? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, Amazon.com. You can get everything on Amazon. Please do enlighten yourself and help support my work. Okay. That's number one. Number two, uh, shortly we'll be in Australia doing um, a chemtrails lecture in Melbourne. And then I'm going to finally roll out this Fay lecture officially in Byron Bay. And I've actually had George Cavasilis contact me and I'm extremely excited to meet with him, meet up with him. Cause I think he's um, got a lot to say while I'm down there. And um, let's see, is there anything? Oh yeah. Maria Wheatley and I are trying to put together a tour into Ireland, but this is, this is another sticky wicket, Greg, because I love Maria and she has no problems with anything that I'm bringing, but anybody who's doing work on anything druidic or fey like or megalithic, particularly in Ireland, is very territorial about the Fae and what they believe about it. So it, that gets to be a bit dicey too. But I don't care. We're going to Ireland in probably in October. Nice. That's what's on the agenda right now, yeah? Very cool. Well, always a pleasure. Uh, let's do this again in the future, all right? Yeah, now, Greg, did you just get married? I got engaged. Same thing. You got engaged. That's what it was. Well, congratulations, man. Thank you. Thank you. Ain't love grand. It is. It is. (laughs) Great. Okay. Well, Greg, let's do it again really soon. Okay. Cool. Will do. All right. Take care out there. All right. Best. Bye. All right. The Return of Cara St. Louis. How about that? I really liked her book with Harold. And the first show we did was really the best breakdown we had of John Taylor Gatto's work and the history of the Prussian education system up until David Rodriguez. And now she's on the new chronology movement. Of course, I love that. I don't think her recall was quite as good this second time around, which I know makes it hard for a listener at times. But the material is also a lot newer and denser. It gets real confusing because you have to have both the mainstream and the alternative timelines and dates and names down to a T to present it with the most clarity. And then to bring in the Fae, that's interesting. I really just don't know enough about the Fae, especially as a seed race or a human bloodline. So few people discuss them in this type of context. And I think that, of course, is the point of why she's on this track. I mean, it's underexposed, underrepresented in the alternative arena. So big thanks to her for tackling it and coming on to talk about it, because so few people can. And everyone says that they think Anatoly Fomenko speaks English, but I have found zero evidence to support that. No audio or video interviews, which I kind of need to hear before I ask him to come on an audio show. But I love the idea of a completely manipulated timeline to justify the ruling family's reign and disguise their exterminations of other cultures, thrusting them into the past and saying, well, we just don't know what happened to them. 
I mean, even the official story does not make the European oligarchs or the Vatican look very good. So imagine what we would get without their special brand of polishing. So who knows exactly how deep that pursuit can go, how long that string can be pulled, or how altered the storyline really is. But think about the bright minds who saw that something was off. This isn't a super new or unique realization. It's happened plenty of times before, just not enough to make a real impact against the loud and proud official narrative. But I do hope you liked it and consider this an avenue worth exploring. Of course, in the Plus show, we did a lot of elaborating, but we also talked about the phantom time hypothesis, which is another history-related manipulation theory, the Mandela effect, which people are loving very hot right now, that Mandela effect. And of course, if we're going to talk about history manipulations, why not also manipulations in the scientific realm? So we hit on things from that angle and a lot of other good stuff. You know the drill. Is this going to be the one that finally gets you to sign up for THC Plus and support this commercial-free, high-quality podcast you know and love so much? Only time will tell. But that is it for me this week. Your move, bad fairies. Your fucking move. Oh no. You see, the world isn't random, it's attached to puppet strings, control over everything. The nine to five is trying to steal ya, now don't that job seem silly? Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back? Some spike agency Wish we were younger And free I'll be thankful when it's all exposed The vast conspiracy There's such a difference Between us And the dead
Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at the HigherSideChatsPlus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable, and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent, one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners, submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the mp3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy 3 months, 6 months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for 5 bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle, sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time?